Uh, Mr. President, during your tenure, there was an issue around electricity and electricity supply. How were you guys able to sort that issue out? And can you just touch a bit on the economic impact it had? Okay. Um, we had an energy crisis and it affected business and industry. And also it made, it was uncomfortable for residential consumers. And there were three facets to the energy crisis. One, we didn't have sufficient generation coming in because we hadn't developed additional power assets, you know, over a period. And the, rate, the economy was growing at an average of 6% per year. Demand was growing at about 8% per year. And so we were not keeping up. Previous governments had not put in enough generating assets. And it all crystallized at the time I came into office. Then the second was there was an energy sector debt. Because what we were doing was we were generating electricity at a certain price. But the tariffs that we were charging the consumers were lower than the cost of the power. And so it meant that the energy utility, which we call the Electricity uh, Company of Ghana, which is your ESCOM here, could not collect sufficient money from tariffs to be able to pay for the power generated. So that was the next problem. Then the third problem was fuel and efficiency of generation. We're using light crude oil, which is very expensive. And so we needed to get a less expensive means of generation. So these were the three problems we faced. So first what we did was we put in emergency power. That led to a plant we call the Ameri plant. It's a 250 megawatt plant. We had a shortfall, we estimated we had a shortfall of about 500 megawatts. And so we're shedding load of between 400 and 500 megawatts every night. So we brought in the um, Ameri, by, uh, Ameri plant, which was 250 megawatts, and we brought a car power ship. There's a floating power plant, it's a badge. Oh, wow. And that brought in another 220 megawatts. And so between the two plants, as soon as we fired them up, we made up for the deficit. But of course, we had planned other, you know, medium term plants that were coming into operation. So those two plants, the emergency plants, covered the deficit. And so we were able to suspend the load shedding, the load management. Now, what we also did was we adjusted the tariffs in order to be able to make it more realistic to be able to pay for the power generated. So that was able to uh, resolve that issue. Then the third thing we did was we introduced an energy sector levy to take care of the legacy debts. There were accumulated debts from the Volta River Authority, which is one of our major power generators, and then from the Electricity Company of Ghana. So we imposed a levy on petroleum products and the money from there went into paying the debts that had accumulated. And so it made the energy sector breathe a little easier. And so that's, those are the measures that we took. Was there ever a discussion around whether or not yeah. that um, the, the electricity utility in Ghana should be privatized? Yes. Yeah. It was not privatization in the true sense of the word. What happened was we had signed a compact with the US for $500 million injection into our energy sector to make it more efficient. And of course, one of the most inefficient parts of our energy value chain is the distributor, that is the electricity company of Ghana. And so part of the money was going there to revamp the electricity company of Ghana and hive off the billing aspects. That is the last mile aspect, that is service to the consumers to a private concessionaire. But electricity company was still going to own its, some assets, including the transformers, the major transformers and all that. And so that was the plan. It's been implemented now, but there are still issues. We want, we want to see how it, it, it will go forward. They've done the privatization or the concessioning. And so a company called Power Distribution Services, PDS, has taken over that function of ECG. And so we'll see how things go. What's the solution, the, the long-term solution? Well, they believe that the private sector would be able to collect. What do you, no, what do you believe? What, what do you think the long-term solution? Well, I think that the private sector is capable of collecting the tariffs more efficiently. Um, a final one, uh, there's, there's, uh, I was watching one of your interviews where you were speaking about um, institutions and the, and the role that they play in a democracy. Mm. 
And one of the questions was around the, the judges at the time who were facing allegations of bribery. Yeah. And you immediately kicked in and said, let there be an inquiry into this yeah. issue. Yeah. Why was it so important? And do you at all think that these allegations may have been seen as a threat to democracy? Because this is at least one arm of, of, of the state. We have three arms of the state, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And the Constitution makes clear provisions as to what role each, each plays, and um, the issue about separation of powers and all that. Now, what had happened was one of our ace investigative journalists had carried through an investigation. And in that investigation, they had attempted to bribe judges dealing with particular cases, and they were filming them. And so there was clear video evidence of people take, accepting monies, and you could hear the discussion about the particular cases that they were trying to influence them with. And the Constitution says that if there are any allegations against judges, the, whoever is making the allegation must petition the president. And so this journalist petitioned me as president. And the Constitution also says what I should do if I receive such a petition. It says that I should refer the petition to the Chief Justice, and the Chief Justice shall empanel, you know, an investigative committee to establish whether a prima facie case has been uh, established against those against whom the allegations have been made. And so the Chief Justice looked at it and said, yes, there was a prima facie case. So then it went into a full-blown investigation, and the judges were given the opportunity to appear before the panel. They were questioned interrogated, and eventually the um, panel gave its recommendations to the Chief Justice who passed it on to the President. And in those cases, if you're found guilty, then the President can remove you from office. And so for those who were found guilty, I had the duty, constitutional duty, to remove them from... Is that enough, though? That, um, that people who are entrusted with such a critical role of being the final arbiter in dispute um, would have accepted bribes, and the hiding that they get is you just removed from office. Well, after they were removed from office, the dockets were sent to the attorney general, but then we left office, and so I don't know really what has happened. But it doesn't end with removal from office. There is also the criminal liability. And so the Attorney General has the power to prosecute. Did it scare you at all when you, when you received this news of this is happening, when you even watched the documentary? Did it scare you that um, there's this critical institution that is um, being tempered with by people who have deep pockets? There had been allegations about corruption in the judiciary. And people used to complain that judges were influenced to give judgments you know, um, in favor of somebody because they had been influenced with some monetary consideration. And so those rumors existed. There was even a time where there was a bipartisan parliamentary inquiry into corruption in the judiciary. But nobody had ever, ever come up with the kind of evidence that we saw in the video. And so it was shocking to the whole country because now here was the evidence that judges could be bribed you know, to give judgments in a certain direction. And so it came as a shocker to everybody, even though there were rumors that, yes, there was corruption in the judiciary, but this was the first time that we were faced with that kind of uh, evidence. But it's not the only sector where this particular journalist has done investigations. He did it in football, and the um, head of our GFA, Ghana Footballers Association, was indicted. He did it in the cocoa sector. There were people smuggling cocoa mm -hmm. across our borders to the next country. And so he did an investigative piece. He did it with our customs officers who took bribes to reduce the duty and levies that they were supposed to charge on imports. And so he's done it in several sectors. And once he presents the evidence, then it's the duty of government to mm -hmm. prosecute. Next year when you run for the election, some are saying that probably the president is a bit too old to be rerunning for the elections. What's your take on this? We have no age restriction in Ghana. I know some countries have, but we don't. 
as long as a person is healthy, he's agile, his thought processes are okay, I don't think there's a problem. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. All right. President. <laughs> And all Thank the best you. in the elections. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate Wish it. Wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> Must make sure that you campaign. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>